Our guest today is one of Britain's longest serving parliamentarians, one of its greatest television personalities, and one of its best known public figures. And that trail of superlatives can lead to only one man, that is Lord Boothby. Thank Welcome. you very much. Lord Boothby, I just said best known personalities, which is true in one sense, but I think it's uh, an illusion that we have, the public has, that we know you. Yes, I don't think you do know me altogether. Very well, anyway. I know myself better. The image that has been projected, I won't say created, because that makes you sound like a product, is of a very flamboyant, happy, contented man. No, I, on the whole, I have led a very full life, but not a frightfully happy one, and certainly not a contented one. Because I've been in rebellion in politics practically the whole of my life, which has made a great difference. People are always asking me, especially taxi drivers, why I wasn't prime minister. Can I ask you? I'm not a taxi driver. But... Well, because I've always been in rebellion against the government of the day on major issues. And if I'd ever got high office, I should have resigned. I should have resigned over Munich, I should have resigned over Suez, I should have resigned over our failure to join Europe in 1949 when I first was sent out there by Churchill as a delegate to the Council of Europe at Strasbourg. I would always have been resigning, and that's a frightful bore, both for the government and for you. And therefore, I preferred to take, and always have preferred to take, an independent line. In a sense, you resigned from politics. It was Churchill himself who said to you, uh, I suppose he called you Bob, did he, or Robert? He called me Bob. Uh, you can either be a television personality or a politician. You can't do both. You chose well, television. Well, he didn't use the word politician. He used the word office. He said you can either go for high office, which I do not promise you, or you can be a star of radio and television. What is your choice? You can't be both. And I said, a star of radio and television every time. Why? And he said, I was afraid that would be your answer. Why did you say that, looking back? Because I thought I'd have a better and a fuller and a more amusing life. And I still think so. When I pop off, there'll be quite a stir in the press. And everybody will say, my God, Bob Boothby's dead, have you seen? But when most of the ministers of which um, I uh, looked at and opposed in the House of Commons for 34 year unbroken years die, nobody will know, remember their names. Very cynical. Ministers haven't got great power, you know. You're, you're a cynical man now, are you? About uh, no, politics? I, no, not altogether cynical about politics, but when I was with Churchill at this parliamentary private secretary at the Exchequer, I realized very clearly how little power the politicians really have as against the civil service. How long did it take you to realize this? Uh, you were, were you 24 or 26 when you first entered Parliament? I, was, I entered Parliament at the age of 24. I know you were very conveniently born in 1900, so it's easy yeah. to always <laughs> remember Every your age. Every time I date a letter, I'm reminded of my age. You're an incredible 75 years old. That's it. You entered Parliament when you were 24, very young. Yeah. Did you make a brilliant speech, your first speech? Um, my first maiden speech was quite good, and my second one was about the fishermen, whom I represented, and that was better. But I entered Parliament, really, through the aegis of Baldwin. I started my political career, well, I started my whole career in Walter Munton's chambers at the bar. And one day he sent for me and said, Bob, your heart's not in the law. You don't really care. And although you might make quite a good advocate in the Marshall Hall style, I don't think you're cut out to be a barrister. And I know that your main interest is politics. Why don't you throw your cap over the stars and take it on? And it so happened that Baldwin was a great friend of my father's and I'd known him since I was a small boy because his sons were at my private school. And Baldwin offered me a job as assistant private secretary when he was leader of the opposition in 1923. 
and that led to my adoption as candidate for Orkney and Shetland in 1923 in the protection election of that year. And there were some Aberdeenshire farmers in Orkney and Shetland. I was told I could go there and that they'd pay my expenses because they were desperate, the Tory party at that time. They hadn't contested Orkney and Shetland for about 50 years. And I enjoyed the islands and the islanders, but I couldn't persuade them that the government was going to give them a pound an acre whether they grew anything or not. And um, uh, I missed it but only by 800 votes. And then you went to East Yes, Aberdeenshire. there were some Aberdeenshire farmers who were buying cattle. And they said, they went back to Aberdeen and they said, look here, if we're looking for a young candidate, there's a boy called Bob Boothby, who's standing for Orkney and Shetland. And he knows nothing about agriculture and less about fishing. <laughs> but we can teach him. And when he opens his mouth on a platform, he goes off like an alarm clock. And you know, so you're making it sound me. like a game, um, a very casual choice of, well, you know, I'll, I'll discard the law, I'll go into politics. Surely it must have been much more important to you. No, I always meant to go into politics. I had a, a quite good baritone voice when I was at Oxford. And uh, my teacher was Freddie Griswold. And Freddie Griswold said, look here, you have the makings of a good baritone voice. Do you want to become a singer? And I said, no, I want to become a politician. And Freddie said, you can't be a singer and a politician. You have to choose. But if you choose politics, there's one thing I can teach you. And that is voice production. And you'll find it comes in very useful. To know how to produce your voice from there instead of there and how to pitch it in a big hall so that it reaches the last row. And Freddie did teach me voice production. And my voice, I wouldn't say has been my fortune, but it's certainly it's not been a misfortune, my voice. It's a well-known voice. And I put that down primarily to Freddie Griswold. You say Freddie Griswold taught you uh, to produce your voice. Yeah. Uh, was it Churchill himself who taught you about the real world of politics? Um, well, I went to Churchill. Baldwin didn't like my going to Churchill very much. Why did you go to Churchill? I was his protege because I wrote him a very offensive letter about the miners in 1926 and said I wasn't going to stand by and watch the miners being bludgeoned back district by district with the weapons of cold and starvation and hunger and uh, misery and uh, that I'd have to leave the Conservative Party if they weren't on. You wrote, wrote this letter to Baldwin? To Ch Churchill. To Churchill? Frightfully impertinent from a young member of Parliament of 26. And the next thing that happened was I received a summons from Churchill to go and see him at the Treasury. So I went in great trepidation, thinking I was in for a tremendous wigging. And he greeted me with open arms and said, thank you for your admirable letter. I'd quoted his father in the letter. I think that's what got him. But he said, I, I agree with a great deal of what you say. And I myself am all on the side of the miners now. Will you become my parliamentary private secretary? And you did. And I did. Now, you have said often that Churchill, of course, was the dominant political influence in your life, oh, you for are. good or for real. But looking back now, would you not agree that really the influence was for ill? On the whole, for ill. I would have been much better to have kept my independence, which was natural and came natural to me. See, Churchill, then, well, curiously enough, the man who warned me against taking the job with Churchill was Sir Oswald Mosley. Yes who was then an important figure in the House of Commons, and he said, if you go to Churchill, you'll lose your independence. And when you have a disagreement, as you most certainly will, and in many, he will regard it as disloyalty and betrayal, and he will treat you accordingly. And that's roughly what happened. We had endless arguments. He was always picking me up and throwing me out. And bruising you? And bruising me. Destroying you? It didn't destroy me. Well, you see, people have said so often, I know that you must be, you know, sick yeah. in, in, in the real sense of hearing this. What happened to that bright political light when you were only 25? People were saying the future leader yeah. of the Tory party. 
a future prime minister. Yeah. And really, it was diminished, it waned, it went. Why? Was it Churchill who did this to you? Uh, Churchill did a great deal to me. I once said to him, you're a natural-born bully, and there's one person you'll never bully, and that's me, and slammed the door in his face, and he didn't like it, and I don't blame him. I was a very, um, um, I wouldn't say conceited, but self-satisfied young man. I was very pleased with myself. I was lionized by the hostesses of London because they thought I was a rising young politician who might become prime minister. I dined with Lady Cunard and Lady Colfax and Mrs. Ronald Greville and so on. And I had a marvelous time as a young rising politician. And I think that did me a, a good deal of harm because it went to my head and I became very conceited. And then I became uh, gradually a rebel, you see. But I think the basis of the whole thing is that I never really had much ambition for political power. I saw the power that Churchill exercised when he was at the Treasury. And he wasn't a good Chancellor of the Exchequer, but he had the right instinct. He was against our going back to the gold standard in 1925 with the wrong parity of exchange. He was overborne by the civil service and by the Bank of England. But when you say that you detested power, uh, all politicians surely want power because otherwise you cannot accomplish anything politically. You can, you know, as a backbencher. I've accomplished a certain amount in my, in my time, politically. But why did you not I... want ultimate power? Why were you frightened of the power that could have been yours? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to use the term frightened, but it seems to me that you... Uh, abnegated responsibility in a sense uh, yes I hated the idea of patronage I hated the idea of appointing people to jobs why because I thought I might be wrong and anyway it was unfair on the people who didn't get the jobs I never wanted to say, be able to say to so and so this is yours you can have this you can be Chancellor of the Exchequer you can be Lord Chancellor I never wanted that sort of power you and didn't want that kind of responsibility over people's lives? I, not much. And I wouldn't have liked sacking them either, which you have to do as Prime Minister. Or in a powerful position. No, do you politics. think that... Um, I'm, I'm sticking with this one subject, and please forgive me. Yeah. Uh, but when the uh, history of this century is written, you yeah. will be mentioned as the potential Prime Minister of the 20s and the 30s. Yeah. Was it your own frivolity that stopped your political career in the No, sense. there was no frivolity about the 30s. The 30s were a nightmare to me because I, I saw it all coming absolutely clearly with almost clairvoyance. You saw before, what? The war. The war. Before Churchill. I had an interview with Hitler, you see, in 1932, which was over a year before he became Chancellor. Two hours. I had after lunch in the Esplanade Hotel, his headquarters in Berlin, and his secretary, Hamstrangel, I've been delivering a series of economic lectures in Hamburg and Berlin, which interested him. Mm. And he rang me up, Hamstrangel, who was Hitler's private secretary, and said, the Führer wants to see you tomorrow afternoon at half past two. Can we just establish, Hitler then was a little known figure internationally, right? Internationally, he was beginning to be well known. Just starting, right. He said to me, I shall be Chancellor within six months. Well, he was within about eight months. But at that point, he was comparatively obscure. Yeah. You met him. What was your impression? Mad. Uh, you looked into his eyes, and I was sitting to him as close as I am to you, and you could see the lunacy, and you could also see the genius. Then I reported to Neville Chamberlain. I said, you were dealing in Hitler with a frantic and ferocious genius, uh, with a destructive genius, almost without parallel in history, and a streak of lunacy. This is not hindsight. No. This was said immediately. This was said immediately. And Chamberlain said, I'm sorry I don't agree with you. I trust her, Hitler. And then I knew the game was up. But the fight 
There were only about six or seven of us involved and headed by Churchill against appeasement and in favor of rearmament and the League of Nations during the 1930s was the most desperate period of my life. I could never have held office during that period under that dreadful government, which I think was one of the worst governments this country has ever had. I couldn't have borne it. And I was happy only in rebellion. But there was no frivolity about it. It was desperately serious and desperately in earnest because I knew that we could have stopped the Second World War. If we'd stood up to Hitler and rearmed, we could have stopped it and backed up Czechoslovakia at the time of Munich. Now, you refer to this as uh, your first great defeat, those years yeah. of fighting against appeasement. Splendidly supported by my constituents all the way through. You talk about your out. defeats with the same pride that other men talk about their victories. Why is that? Well, I don't know. Uh, you struggle, and if you struggle your hardest and do your very best, and I certainly did struggle and tried hard during those years and go down in failure, you just accept it. It was the same after the war with Europe. Well, you see, a very wise politician has said about you that you were always right, but unfortunately you were right ahead of the time to be right. Would you agree Nicholas with that? Davenport said that. I think on the whole he was right. And that you were right, and I was but right. out of tempo. I think he was right, but, but, but ahead, of, ahead of my time. And what happened, what I said was going to happen, happen. Does that give you any satisfaction, though, uh, to know that one was right? Isn't it a, a frustrating thing to know one is right and still not be able to accomplish it? It was frightfully frustrating at the time, but looking back at what the history books may say about me, if they say anything at all, uh, it'll give me a certain satisfaction. Because I was right. I was right over Hitler. I was right over Suez. I was right over Europe. Because the time for us to have gone into Europe was in 1949. Now Churchill, who'd uh, dropped me for several years, picked me up again for the Tobruk debate, when he was rather frightened of the debate in the House of Commons, and said, uh, do you still support me? And I said, there's nobody else to support. And he said, will you speak for me during the debate? And I said, well, I have got some notes ready. And he said, took me to the speaker himself and said, I want Mr. Booth be called fifth in the debate. And it was the censure debate after the fall of Tobruk. And he was really frightened. The only time in the war I ever saw him frightened. And uh, my speech was not one of my worst. I altered <laughs> the mood of the house and I made them laugh because Sir John Wardlow Mill had proposed that the Duke of Gloucester should succeed him as Commander-in-Chief of all our forces. And this was easy meat for a funny speech. And uh, afterwards he took me to the smoking room in the House of Commons and drank a toast to the Pegasus wings of my oratory and thanked me for my speech. And then I never heard from him again for a year and a half. And then he picked me up again to send me to Europe, to the Council of Europe. I would like to ask you about your, your staunch uh, Europeanism, if there is such a word. Yeah. And yet you are so proud of being a Scot and Scots nationalism. How can you relate or balance these I'm not a Scottish things? nationalist. I'm not a member of the Scottish Nationalist Party. You're proud of being or a Scot. Only party. But I'm proud of being a Scot. But I think the Scots have a great part to play in Europe as a nation. Then how do you feel about the, the, the emergence of Scots nationalism, Scottish nationalism? Well, I'm not terribly interested in it. I think it'll go a certain distance. I think it'll go on. But I think it's more important that Scotland should get into Europe and play her part as Scotland, the same as Ireland does in Europe, and rather independently of England. Because I think Scot the Scots have got a genius for foreign affairs and for mingling with foreigners and for getting on with foreigners. Wherever you go all over the world, you find them running the show in most cases. Except in Scotland. Except in Scotland, which they leave. <laughs> Can we talk about this, uh, your own background? Was it your father or your mother who gave you or uh, tried to create a love of music in your soul? Oh, they were both very musical. My 
My father was a composer, no small merit. And he played the piano beautifully, and my mother played the piano very well. And they gave me my love of music. And they took me to all the good concerts. And music has played a great part in, in my life. I know it has. I think uh, you... Thomas were... Beecham was a great friend of mine, you know. And I like to listen to it alone. That's why I called it my secret vice. And now you've given it up in uh, the last... When did you... You married nine years ago? I married seven years ago. Seven years ago. And you said that you gave up music when you met Wanda. Yeah, it, it's the, it, she took the place of music, emotionally. So I don't go to so many concerts now. I used to go to a great many and enjoy them enormously. And was a great friend of Thomas Beecham's, as I've said, who was a tremendous character, and a Malcolm Sargent. I used to have a permanent seat in Malcolm Sargent's box for the promenade concerts. And I used to go and sit there and enjoy myself. And I've had more pleasure, and I did a lot of music. I used to go to Germany when I went and saw Hitler. I told you that story. I told it the other day about Hitler, my greeting with Hitler. Which was? Well, when, when he sent for me, I had a jolly good lunch at Hoche's restaurant in Berlin. I told this the other day um, uh, in the press, and I think on television. But it's a funny story, because it's true. And I was arrived there, fortified by a bottle of Hock and a couple of large brandies. And um, Hamstangle said, the Führer awaits you. So I went into a long room. The dictators always had long rooms to overawe you. And I marched across the floor of this long room, and at the very end, Hitler was sitting at a desk with a swastika round his arm and a brown shirt. And he waited till I got right outside him and sprang to his feet, clicked his heels together, put up his right arm and said, Hitler! And the hawk and the brandy came to my rescue, and I clicked my heels together and put up my right arm and said, Boothby! <laughs> and, uh, Hamstangle said, the Führer's never been greeted this way before. And I said, well, why does he greet other people this way? I thought it was the correct thing to do. Lord Boothby, um, one of your books is called My Yesterdays, Your, tomorrow. your Tomorrows. And... At this stage in your life, your yesterdays are outweighing the possibilities of your tomorrows. Oh, of course. And when one looks back, do you find a balance of contentment in your life? I'm not asking if you're a happy man, but are there achieved. any great regrets? Oh, who hasn't got regrets? There are lots of things that I wish I'd done that I didn't do much more that way than the other way around. There are a few things I've done that I regret, but a lot of things I'd have liked to have done which I uh, didn't do, and I regret that. But such as? Such as, uh, I think, playing a, a more vehement part in the House of Commons than I did. I made some pretty good speeches. I got the Wolfenden Committee set up pretty well single-handed which was quite an achievement. And I got the Radcliffe Committee on Monetary Policy. All this was since the war. Yes. But um, I sh should have struggled harder over Europe in 1949 than I did. I should have come back and made impassioned speeches in the House of Commons against the government. And I didn't speak out enough. Lloyd Boothby, may I thank you very much for joining us today and being our guest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please join our Facebook group. It's called Praise Crime Lords of London. We're a friendly moderated group with over 1,000 Cray and other celebrated gangster videos available for view. There's also thousands of images in the photos sections. The link for the group is in the YouTube description section. I hope we see you there soon.